Well, thank you very much and thank you for inviting me. It's of course a pleasure to be here in this context and, and with this kind of a bright young researchers, the future of memory research in Europe. So it's an honor to be here encountering you when you are before you get famous. So, uh, so it's a, a, as we see today, uh, we'll be talking about two topics, uh, memory networks and memory representations. So I, instead of having, I mean, one hour of introduction for the two topics and then one hour of my work, I decided to split that. So the first hour will focus on networks and the second hour on representations, each with an introduction. So these are the people who did the work. I mean, uh, Simon Davis, who was a po uh, graduate student and then a postdoc briefly in my lab and now is faculty at Duke University in Neurology. Ben Guy, Zach Monji, and M Matt Steinle are all graduate students in my lab. And Erin Wick uh, is a postdoc in my lab. So I do not always have men in my lab. <laughs> sometimes, we're, sometimes we're all women, but this kind of goes by, by kind of waves. And so it just happens that they have all guys. So women, please apply. <laughs> so, so these are the people who, who provided the, the, the money and, and this. Okay, so for first, uh, part one, so memory networks will be the focus of the first hour. So let's, uh, you know this stuff, but let's start by reminding you what's the standard episodic uh, memory model of how memory traces are stored in the brain and recovered, right? So the standard idea is that when you have a, an event, let's say that this is an event, it's a, it's a combination of visual details, sounds, meanings, and series. So for example, here, this is an event. I mean, let's say that you're listening to me and you have kind of a, my voice is a sound and, and then you're looking at the screen or the context and then spatial context where you're sitting, the meanings of what is happening and so forth. So the standard model is that these are not stored in one place in the brain, but rather they are broken into pieces and scattered over the cortex in the same places that are involved in processing information during perception. So the idea is that visual details information will be stored in the same visual cortex. Uh, and this is an activated region during encoding. So we scan a person while learning something visual, we'll see visual cortex, of course. Then auditory uh, traces in auditory cortex, perhaps meanings in left temporal cortex and so forth. So and the idea is that during, during a, has to be a place in the brain that has a unified representation of what happened here, right? So, and that's supposed to be the role of the hippocampus where there is a microcosmos of this event kind of stored there with these links, right, between this context. So that later when you have a retrieval cue, let's say we, we see each other one day you see me at a conference and you are reminded of this lecture. So that retrieval cue supposedly activates, right, the memory traces in the hippocampus, the, these indexes, which leads to the reactivation of those cortical traces. So here the reactivation is the idea that the same regions that were, was activated during encoding is reactivated during retrieval, and that reactivation, coordinated reactivation of the same brain regions, right, of, of being here, the sound, this room, et cetera, is what allows you to have the experience of remembering being here. So this is the standard model, and several pieces have been supported by evidence. Other pieces are more speculative so far. So the focus, uh, this is involves also, this doesn't occur in isolation of the rest of the brain, of course. They are critical to have frontoparietal regions that uh, support control processes. Uh, such as semantic processing, organizational process during encoding that allows you to organize information as you're stored, but also process it during the retrieval, for example, attention processing, parietal cortices, and so forth. So this coordinated kind of network of regions is what uh, allows us to have a, the experience of remembering. So in the first part, I will focus on interactions among these regions, and the second part, I will focus more on the process of reactivation per se. Okay, so first I will start talking a, a little bit about the networks in general, right? So the, the, I mean, you have, some of you may be doing, who, any of you are, are doing network research? Kind of, uh, uh, or doing kind of with fMRI, for example, resting state, or, okay, so it's becoming very popular, particular resting state has become a, a really, I mean, if you look at the number of uh, papers that have been published in the last few years, really an exponential function with resting states, so, 
Um, and then I will take in particular to graph theory, which is a one way of analyzing those results, which I think is particularly useful to link to cognitive neuroscience. And then in the second part, I will talk about three studies from my lab, right? They're focusing on, on the particularly in the hippocampus and integration with the network, and then also the, the compensatory role uh, a study with TMS. Okay, so let's start with the introduction. So let, let me tell you briefly about my history with networks because I kind of went back and forth in this. So when I was a postdoc, I was, I was very interested. Actually, my postdoc with, with Randy McIntosh, you may know, you know not him now, but at that time was one of the main figures in network research because he actually was one of the first who applied structure equation modeling to investigate pet data, which was what we had at that time, right? So we basically will take pet data, do correlations, which at that time were only correlations across subjects, right? Because the pet they didn't allow you to do within subject correlations across trial as we can do now with event-related fMRI, right? So we'll do these kind of correlations and then we'll apply structure equation modeling. So uh, actually, uh, I published this in 97, I mean, <laughs> kind of, uh, 20 years before, I mean, ago when uh, still the networks were not that popular. At that time, it was actually kind of weird to publish networks because it was the beginning at that time of the of the fMRI of the imaging, and the people were focusing primarily on, on brain regions. So um, at that time, the the structure equation modeling was primarily theory guided in terms of, for example, here in that study, I compared the effects of aging and in which we had found kind of a more bilateral recruitment in older adults, and we're looking at how those regions that are recruited in older adults were interacting with the ones in the other hemisphere. So it was kind of driven by some ideas about that. So then uh, I became rather an, an interested in resting uh, in networks, particularly because I didn't get very excited with the resting state networks. So I will tell you why. I mainly because they focus on uh, and at that time, I, I still kept doing connectivity, but primarily focused on, on bivariate connectivity, right? So a couple of regions, I say, the connectivity between the hippocampus and the frontal lobes, the connectivity between the hippocampus and parietal cortex, so very specific. And, but uh, at that time, and let's say between kind of uh, the, the late 90s until kind of uh, the, a few years ago, most network and studies focus on resting state networks, right? So I, I had a few problems with that. I mean, they, usually, they are usually atheoretical. So, so then, I mean, they, they use methods data-driven that separates a group of networks, but don't, are not sometimes integrated with what we know about these regions, right? So they will tell you, okay, well, this is a group of regions in the default network, and what do these regions do? And they, sometimes they answer, oh, well, they do what the default network does, right? But then what's that the default network does? And sometimes there is not, a clear answer. So sometimes they give you a very vague function, okay, the, 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 the default network does daydreaming or, or self kind of processing or kind of a, a simulation and so forth. So, and I also uh, did not fit well with functional connectivity during cognitive tasks. So sometimes the regions that are interacting during rest are not necessarily the most closely related during a memory task. Let's say that, for example, the connection between the left ventrolateral PFC and the hippocampus, which is very common during learning, right? So it's actually the most typical regions, let's say in the subsequent memory effects, so activity that is associated with later memory is this connectivity between the inferior frontal cortex and the hippocampus. Those are not part of the same resting state networks, right? So the hippocampus typically will fall in the default network, whereas the, the ventral regions sometimes may interact, but they are not necessarily an important component. So I didn't see a clear, uh, were not seem to be very useful for me, but during the last couple of years, I kind of became very excited about graph theory because I think graph theory allows really to look both at the, at the forest, right? But also at the trees, right? Because you can look at the, at the, or the whole network, but also look at the nodes in particular and see how these individual nodes, which we can know their function from a tons of decades of research on a specific brain regions, we can link them to their role within a global network. So this is what I like. And also can be applied to success-related activity from even-related fMRI, which I think is critical. Okay, so and also, I mean, something that I'm particularly interested in now is to look at an intermediate state, an intermediate between the region and the whole brain network, right? Because imagine that you think the brain as a big organization, right? So 
and, and you are looking at a region, let's say that is the CEO, for example, of, of an organization, right? The CEO is not directly connected to the whole organization, let's say, I don't know, Microsoft or something like that, right? There is a group of kind of uh, uh, regions, I mean, the people that he could, would connect intermediate, right? That they are the ones that then connect to the, each of the, the managers of the different companies, each of the executives, of, right? So, so without understanding this cascade of processes, I mean, from one region to the rest of the brain, it's difficult to, to integrate the function of a region with the whole brain. So see, the, the, for me, this intermediate state is something, intermediate networks is what is missing now in, in some of the network work. Okay, so let me kind of emphasize some of the, the issues I have with the REST in state network. Let's take the default mode network, right? So, you know, the default mode network is a group of regions that here are, are indicated in these in different colors here. And one issue about the, the REST in state network is that they can be decomposed into many parts, right? So you start with this whole network, we go, okay, this is the REST in state, and people use that sometimes as a as uh, just a crystallized network, right? They say, okay, well, this is the, the, these regions are part of the default network as, uh, as if they are, that's their definition, right? They, what they do, right? But if you start doing some analysis, you start breaking them down. So the default network, for example, has a core component, which is uh, kind of the posterior cingulate and the anterior medial POC here in yellow. And then this works by Andrew Hanna shows that there are also other regions that are more uh, not always involved or less associated, the, which are the, called subsystems. There is one subsystem that is the kind of the retrosplenial, the parahippocampal cortex and the hippocampal formation, which are, I mean, our loved memory regions, right? Sometimes play together with other default network regions, sometimes they don't. Then you also have the, the TPJ here in the other region, in blue, the TPJ, the left temporal, the, the lateral temporal cortex and the anterior temporal pole, which are more semantic components, right? These regions associated with semantics. This is also another subsystem that sometimes go together with the default network, sometimes it doesn't. So the, the thing is that you can actually, when you do experiments, you can dissociate any of these regions, right? So just to give you an example, for example, one study in which we found that, for example, if you look at the, at the activity in the posterior cingulate cortex, um, regardless of whether the information is internal or external, so whether you are actually uh, having a, um, an information that is imagined or, or seen in the screen, you see that there is a clear dissociation with uh, the activations during encoding and activations during retrieval. Whereas when you look at the hippocampus, you see that actually has a different pattern being generally activated for successful encoding and retrieval, and you don't get these encoding versus retrieval differences, right? So just two regions, the PCC and the hippocampus, right, that here that are the part of the network can be dissociated. Even closer, right, the retrospinial, the posterior cingulate cortex and the retrospinial cortex here is two. You see we associated, for example, in another study the, with uh, Sander Dasselar, uh, that the retrospinia show this pattern of activity from definitely new to definitely old, which is, is suggests recollection, whereas the posterior cingulate cortex show more linear pattern associated with familiarity. So all these are regions of the default network. The medial PFC, here these two regions are also component of the default network, and you can be dissociated in a study we found the doors had to be more for processing others and, and than self and the, uh, the reverse for the medial PFC. But even when you say, well, you can say, well, these are different parts of the default networks. These are some subsystems, are dissociations between the core and the subsystems. But even the two core regions, right? Because if you look at the history of the, of the default networks, it started like a group of like 10 regions that are supposed to go together, and this is the default network. And then you start taking parts, right? Oh, this is a subsystem. Well, that doesn't, this is another subsystem. Well, you end up basically with only two regions, the, the, the posterior cingulate and the, and the anterior medial PLC, but there are also evidence of dissociation with them. They just to cite one by Sestieri, for example, they found that just a, whereas the posterior uh, angular gyros and posterior cingulate precunions here, so these, these ones that tend to go together, but let's say that the, the, the posterior cingulate uh, were significantly activated during memory retrieval and anterior BNM node the medial prefrontal cortex was strongly deactivated. So that region was deactivated. So this is something that we see sometimes during retrieval, the posterior one being activated, the anterior being deactivated. So when you start dividing and dividing and dividing, and each of these regions can play separately, you start wondering how useful is to talk at networks as fixed things that happen 
in, in many tasks that you can name them and identify them as group of regions that tend to go together. I think, I mean, there is very useful perhaps for, for clinical research when you can put people in the scanner for five minutes and then say, okay, well, this group of patients, like schizophrenics and control, or any two groups different in this group of regions, but uh, not sometimes for cognitive and neuroscience research. So, just uh, pushing with these ideas, uh, Moscovich, uh, Maurice Moscovich and I kind of wrote a couple of papers. We have one in which we're working now about kind of this idea of a smaller uh, networks that we call process-specific alliances or PSAs, which uh, really I think represents the way that cognitive neuroscientists have been typically working. I mean, more by varied connectivity. So sometimes two, sometimes three. I mean, this is the way that theoretically we tend to think when we think about kind of a specific task. So there are, let me talk about some of the differences between these two approaches. So whereas the, the, the re resting state kind of networks are typically identified data-driven, it's a group of co-activated regions, these are often, the PSAs are hypothesis-driven. So for example, let's say here during memory, we assume that the frontal lobes and the, the inferior frontal cortex, the left ventrolateral PFC and the hippocampus form a, a PSA that is involved in encoding with the uh, left prefrontal cortex controlling semantic processes and the hippocampus storing the representation. So each of the regions have a clear function and we have a hypothesis of what these two regions are doing together. This is different than in the case of the of resting state networks in which you um, don't have a specific hypothesis of what the regions are doing in the network. You're saying, okay, they tend to go together, but not much. So again, these are typically many regions, typically two or three. Another importance is that we, typically people in the resting state, consider them relatively stable, right? So different, in different conditions, you can see again the default network. Yes? I would like to ask, what is the difference between what people are doing in the scanner for the resting state network study versus process specific? Ah, okay, well, these are typically just people are asked to, to rest in a conscious rest. Sometimes they typically are asked to just look at the screen, fix, uh, sometimes not, but usually they have just to look at the fixation and just rest. Here I'm talking about the ones we typically find during specific tasks, memory tasks, attention tasks, and so forth. And typically are, are these pairs of regions are based on our theories of how about the task works, right? So we assume from memory research that the frontal lobes and the hippocampus interact for the formation of memory traces. So we have a specific hypothesis about that. But the, so these are, are supposed to be generally common, uh, regardless of the task, to be stable, whereas these are temporary. Why? We don't assume that the ventrolateral BFC and the hippocampus are always interacting together. We assume that in this particular task, they're pretty good. that's why we call them kind of uh, alliances. We like the word alliance because, I mean, like any alliance, it's just tra transitory just for the need for a particular goal, right? Then the regions can play with other regions. And so then uh, the advantage of, of the, of the resting state is that they are easier to identify. You can just put people in the scanner, whereas these are harder, right? You need to do a particular a task. It's sometimes very complex task in order to isolate the specific regions in the task. The regions are connected are typically many to many, whereas this is one to one or one to a few. Generally, even when you go to, to three, you, you assume that perhaps there is an inter... An example of that will be the effect, for example, of the frontal lobes on the posterior cortices during attention, right, in which the frontal lobes upregulate occipital activity during visual attention, for example. When you have three, it's typically one control region modulating the transfer communication between other regions. Let's say the frontal lobes may be controlling the communication from occipital to, to anterior temporal, right? So then uh, talking about, oh wow, I spent a lot of time on this. <laughs> so, um, so then when you talk about the, the functions, so this sometimes very vague, uh, whereas these are specific processes. Anyway, so you can read that later, I can give you the slides on this. So I also have another slides of typical examples of PSAs in memory research, which are, which are pairs of regions that have been reliably found to play together in a specific conditions, like the hippocampus with the angular gyros, the ventrolateral PFC with the medial temporal lobes, the hippocampus with the cortex. So an example of that is, uh, for example, the angular here, the hippocampus and the angular gyros, so the ventral parietal cortex interacts during recollection. Here, the ventrolateral PFC and the middle temporal lobe during encoding success. 
the hippocampus and the cortex doing reactivations that we will talk later, right, when the hippocampus reactivate the memory traces. So anyway, so I wanted to say this, this was one of the, my view until a couple of years ago, okay, networks are not particularly useful, this type of thing for cognitive neuroscience, but then enter graph theory, I think that graph theory changed my mind. So in mathematical and computer science, graph theory is the study of graph, and graph consists of nodes and edges. Um, is uh, often used in linguistic chemistry, social science, and so forth. So this is an example of a network, which is the, the connections between the friends of a, one particular person that took the, 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 the trouble of going over, or the, his Facebook friends, one, and, and then group them by different colors in terms of whether high school friends, the college friends, uh, the girlfriend friends, here in yellow, and the university colleagues. So, I mean, just by looking at that, this probably you can imagine that the the girlfriend is uh, might be in academics too, right? Because <laughs> it's kind of very connected to the university colleagues too. But the, so these each of these um, if each of these lines is is indicating a friendship, and and the groups show clearly that these are, are subgroups of nodes that forms these modules, right? We'll talk about these modules. So this is actually the, the Facebook across the whole world. Right, they actually, these are, these are connections, the strength of, of uh, the number of friends being connected across the world, and it's very interesting. The, you see, actually, you can see the cities, right, or probably also the, the, the popularity or the availability of, uh, of internet in different, in different countries and so forth, but you can see that there are many people connected from the West, uh, Eastern US to Europe, right? So it's a, anyway, so um, what do you think this network is? So this is a network, and these are different types of, of possible associations within the network. So, so these actually are a sexual relationships over a 10-month period among 600 seniors in a Midwestern high school. So each of these, uh, these connections is a, is a kind of a, a couple of students that, that had that sexual encounter. So it's a, I mean, actually, this was one of the things that popularized actually studying networks in social, in social sciences because they actually can be extremely useful. For example, imagine how useful is understanding this relationship perhaps for prevention, right, of sexually transmitted disease or for understanding kind of a behavior of groups. And so, um, so, but you can see that there are, there are some, some, uh, some uh, nodes, I mean, in the network that are particularly kind of are linking many different, different kind of sub-networks, right? That in terms of like, for example, kind of the, the, this guy here kind of uh, is critical for the, <laughs> the maintenance of the, okay. So, um, now you can, in this case, it's clear what the nodes are, right? It's one person, right? But how do you define a node? And this is a topic of intense debate in this area. So, is the new, I mean, you can say if you have, for example, working with a C. elegans worm, you can actually make the neuron the node. And this is amazing because in, in the C. elegans, they have been able to, to trace, to map every single relationship between the neurons, right, in, in these uh, uh, small organisms, right? So you can actually look and do a network analysis about how these neurons are connected. Of course, at the level of the brain, we cannot do that using imaging. So there are many definitions of how do you find a node. So it's a brain region or, or, or kind of a, it could be a, a different levels of analysis. So there is no a, a single solution, but actually it's a, it's a very difficult problem in this area. So just basically, how do you construct a network? So you can first, I mean, in terms of uh, imaging, you can uh, networks, you can do both uh, structural networks in which you look at the structural connectivity between different, different nodes or functional networks in, in which you do like a fMRI or, or PET or other type of a functional or EEG even across different brain regions, right? So, so basically you start by, by doing a, a parcellation in terms of dividing the, the brain in parts and then look at the correlations between these regions, the type of associations they have. In the case of uh, a structural, you can use actually histological data to actually measure actual connections. But more commonly, we, I mean, in imaging, you are using diffusion tensor imaging in which you can kind of uh, quantify the number of connections between different regions using streamlines. So a streamlines is a kind of a computer kind of a, a measure that basically is, uh, estimates the number of fiber tracks connecting a region. It's only an estimate, of course, but allows you to take how connected the regions are. 
in, in, in a functional a brain networks is a correlation in activity across time, right? So imagine that you either have during rest, so where, where the time is basically the TRs in, the, in, each, in each image. So if, if two regions tends to go together, then this, uh, this is the correlation, right? In, you can also do it at the level of trials, so in, when you have a task. In this case, you can isolate the activity for the trial doing first, let's say, an even related analysis and getting the beta, so, so basically the, the amount of activity for each trial, and then you correlate them at the level of trial. So, um, so these, these, these are known as adjacency matrices, but basically are correlation matrices between, here you have all the regions and all the regions, right, with each, each uh, cell telling you the strength of the correlation, right, here typically color-coded, right? So this is another, another way of describing that, right? So for example, you say, well, when you basically from the adjacency metric, you, uh, you uh, abstract like a, a matrix, uh, a, con a connection kind of matrix like this, in which you would tell you, okay, two regions, A and A, for example, are not connected, A and B are connected. So this is but you, one way of doing that is to threshold. So if you threshold this, then you get a, then you get a binary network. Basically, this will become all black and white, and you can say if two regions are connected, basically where there is a positive connection above the threshold. So it's easier to explain in binary network how it works. So once you have that, that binary connections, then you can basically see, okay, if, if, a, is, uh, if a is connected to B, so you put a, a link, okay, A is connected also to E, then you put a link and then you know that B is connected also to e, to e, then you can basically put another, another edge. Right? So this is easier to understand with binary, with binary network, but most of the analysis we do in our lab are, are with non threshold networks. So these, instead of being ones and zero, are continuous numbers, but the logic is the same. It's just the analysis are a bit more complex. So. Okay, so have you heard about the small world network, so a small world, the word, a small world? <coughs> yeah? So the idea is that uh, this comes from a term from an experiment done by, by Milgram in 67. He asked how, how connected are two strangers, and he, he asked uh, a, a people, a students in, in Nebraska, uh, to send letters to, to a particular person so broken in Boston, but doing it through friends, right? So you, you have, okay, they give you a name in Boston, and you have to send it. You cannot send directly, so you send to a friend that might have a friend in, in Boston, then that friend doesn't know someone in Boston, send it to another friend that might know someone in Boston, until I, I finally reach. And it's amazing that actually only takes about six te steps from unknown people to reach each other. So that, that's if you've heard about six degrees of separation, right? That, that's where, where this idea comes from. So um, in terms of networks, the idea is that you, you want to have both a kind of a, a connectivity. When you have connectivity very close to, to, to adjacent nodes, then, then you have a very integrated section of the network, but this is very um, ineffect ineffective to do long distance connections, right? So if this, for example, you have to go from here to here, you have to go many, many, many steps. So on the other hand, the random is very effective in that sense, but lacks this close connectivity. Uh, so the, the small world has both properties. So it has the efficient long distance communications of integration. So here you can go from any, from any node to another node in a few steps from here, from here to here. You just go from here to here to here. Right, so it's, it's a, it's, but also you have a, the preserve kind of a, the clustering or segregation, so highly interconnected networks. So this is the, and there is a, this has been, this small network has been found in a variety of domains, so in social, in social sciences, in, I mean, economics, in many, and the brain is, is one has a, a small network structure. So, um, so the, for example, the one way of measuring the, the efficient communication is using path length. So, so path lens calculates the number of steps that you need to go from one node to another node. For example, this is one, two, three, right? So one, two, three, four, five. So the, the, the shorter, kind of the average, the smaller, the average path lens of a network, the most efficient communication. That means you can go from one part to another part in the fewer steps. So this is ideal, right, in terms of the brain because you can basically connect from one region to another region very, very fast. 
So, uh, uh, but also you need, as I mentioned before, the, the tight local interconnections that allows a, a region to operate with the neighbors in a particular function. You have to observe a function, right? You want the, say, the visual cortex to do what the visual cortex does in identifying an object which needs a, 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 a complex computation between visual cortex, but at the same time be able to send that information fast to the frontal lobes, for example. So you need both. So the, the lower clustering is when each, each node is connected to other nodes, but they are not connected among themselves. And the higher clustering is when they also have strong connections. So think again of Facebook, right? If you have friends that are, don't know each other, so then you have a low clustering. But if your friends are also friends of each other, you form a group that has a high cluster or, of a module, right? So why do they like graph theory? Is that the graph theory can be easily applied to success-related functional connectivity. So when you do a task and identify a group of regions that are involved in the task, then you can look at their relationship using graph theory and also look at the, at the role of the net, subnetworks, right? Which is something that, that allows, is, as I mentioned before, is something that I think is critical to start linking the work, all the tradition we have in cognitive neuroscience about the functions of individual regions, right? You, I would say that 90% so far of the work in cognitive neuroscience has been about the individual regions, right? So there are over, I think, 12,000 papers on the hippocampus. I mean, there was like 10,000 a couple of years ago, there are probably over 12,000 now. So 12,000 papers about one single region, right? We know a lot about the, about the hippocampus. But if we were study about the networks and cannot say what the hippocampus does within the network, we are not really using all that knowledge. So we have to be able to think both at the level of regions and at the level of networks. So, and, and this is what they like, is that you can get both global and nodal measures, right? Okay, so let's say, I think it took more than, yeah, well, I actually started 9.05, so it's actually half an hour of introduction. So, okay, so let me start now with the, the, the studies from from my lab. So we'll start first about a couple of studies. So as you see, there are a lot of papers now that we have under review. So, so the, some of the data is still being analyzed, and I use them more of an examples of things that they're doing, not necessarily are complete. So, so they, they, they are. So I mean, we, one is published, the other ones are, are kind of still uh, in progress, right? So first about the integrative role of the hippocampus during retrieval. So there has been, a, a, as you may know, there is a group of regions that are typically activated during memory retrieval. And that sometimes has been called the retrieval sex network or, or uh, Mick Rack has called it the recollection networks. One, one way in which uh, um, Mick Rack and, and, and King tried to, to investigate that was to do a, a, what we call, call a, a poor man's kind of whole brain network analysis is by doing a series of seed uh, connectivity analysis. So he would take one of these regions, like the angular gyros, so, I mean, uh, which is one of the most uh, strongly associated, and then look at all the connectivity uh, across these uh, connectivity effects here in blue with the rest of the brain, then take another region, let's say the medial PLC, and do the same, and then the hippocampus and do the same, and then start looking at the overlap across these different kind of seed-based connectivity, right? So this is one approach, and it has shown that there are regions that basically are interconnected no matter from where you start, right? You can put the a seed from different places. So. And, and the first, I mean, a study that we seen during retrieval using graph theory was the Shettle Bauer uh, 2014, uh, and they used a small set of, uh, of nodes that were basically regions that were activated during the task, and then look at the relationship, and, and then they found now uh, actually that the hippocampus showed greater kind of uh, um, integra integrated properties from. Uh, than the, for the correct and incorrect trial. This was a spatial and temporal memory trial. So this was the, the, the closest antecedents to the work that we did. So in our study, we focus on, on vivid versus dim scene recall. So people study scenes and then at retrieval, they recall the scenes and they rated their imagery and we confirmed that the ratings were valid by measures of memory later. So I will actually show that that study in the second part because we also use it for, for reactivation, right? So, and, and we looked at differences in hippocampal functional connectivity. So, there are different ways of partitioning the brain when you do this analysis. Here, we use the 90 
uh, 90 nodes of the uh, Harvard Oxford ROI, so we didn't include the cerebellum, but most all the ROIs, so you see, they are, the, the number of atlases may vary typically for, I mean, 80 or, or uh, 200, they are even uh, 800, the kind of partitioning, so they are, have pros and cons, and there are many issues of whether you keep them the same size or not, because if they are different size, they are also possible confounds, so there are different discussions about how to partition that. So you, as I mentioned, you start with the adjacency matrices. So, so in this case, we look at the basically divided, the, even though they had a rating from one to four, we basically divided one, two versus three, four, kind of low vividness and high vividness of retrieval, which will be like a successful versus unsuccessful retrieval. And then we looked at the, at the connectivity of, of the regions that were, they're showing these activations across trials, right, for the high, vividness trial versus the low vividness trial. So these are, these, are, these are actually correlations, right, from zero to one. And of course, in the diagonal, right, when you compare the same region, kind of you have a, a one. But I mean, what you see is striking here is that you can actually can eyeball the difference, right? I mean, just by across the whole brain, right? I think you can see that there is a stronger, more positive connections for, for the vivid than the dim. It was a, it was a, I thought it was, was great that actually just by that you can see how the brain is being more integrated, more correlated, right, with each other, all these regions when they are actually having a successful a vivid retrieval. So then we applied a graph theory and for focus on, on integration measures, right? There's a group of measures that measure primarily how integrated regions are. One is the path length that I mentioned before. So the number of steps that you go from here to here, for example, one, two, three, four. And um, so the shorter the path length, it reduces the amount of noise and signal degradation, so the better the communication. And uh, so the, the shorter the path is, the length is the better. So you can also use the measure of global efficiency, which is the inverse. So in that case, uh, global efficiency is uh, the, the higher, the better, right? So then we'll also look at degree centrality, which is then uh, the identifies nodes with many connections to other nodes in the network. So for example, this node has four connections, so it's a high, it's a, has a high degree centrality. So that will be a popular person in Facebook, right? So that has many friends, has lots of connections. Another measure that is related to that is known as page rank centrality, is that in connections to other nodes uh, that, uh, uh, that also have, uh, have uh, many, you may not have many connections, but you have friends that have many, con uh, many friends, right? So it's kind of being friends of popular people, even if you're not popular, right? So, so it, which is a still is an advantage because still you can communicate information, right? You may not know many people, but if you say something to your popular friends, it's spread rapidly through the network, right? So it's still, so, but this is another interesting measure that they sometimes use and not, not always goes together, right, with page rank centrality. And finally, we created this measure that Ben created. So always when I see we, I, I mean them, right? So, so, so the, the, and if I say kind of them, I mean, I must not even involve. So, so the, the first step reorganization. Um, so basically what we did this is just take the, the, the first step connections, so all the first step connections, and just look at their change across conditions, right? So, so if a region is, has a series of connections to other brain regions, then you correlate that, that series of connect, connections in condition A and condition B and see how, how they are reorganized. So the more correlated they are, Right, so if you have a strong connection with that region, if region A has a strong connection with region B, but a weak connection with region C in condition A, but in condition B, in condition B is the same, strong with, with B, weak with C, you have a high correlation, right? So that means a small change. If they, there is a, a, a low correlation, that means a big reorganization, right? So anyway, what we found is that the right hippocampus showed actually greater communication efficiency and information integration in vivid that dim. So we found the right hippocampus and not the left, eh, although it was a trend, show a so shorter path length for, um, for, the, um, for hits than misses, right? But here is hits and misses is the vivid, sorry. It's, it's miss and it's the same, I just an error here. So it should say vivid and dim. So also the greater degree centrality, so many connections and also connected to more central nodes. So this, this actually is clearly consistent with the idea that the hippocampus play a major role in the retrieval network, right? But, but actually this hasn't been shown before. I mean, even though 
there was a, is a, there is an assumption that the hippocampus really is, is uh, integrating information from many parts of the brain, and that model supposed that that happens during retrieval, right? When all these regions are activated, they have to be, all the inform uh, have to be integrated in the hippocampus. This clearly shows that. Um, um, so I, I, what actually was striking is the other 89 nodes did not show vivid dim differences in this net in this. Uh, so the, the hippocampus was the only one that actually showed change in, in network connectivity in these measures. And um, so as I mentioned, yeah, it fits with the, with the role of the hippocampus in integration. Then we, we, need, uh, we looked at actually uh, the, how is the, the ranking changes in these, uh, in these measures, negative path length, which is kind of I mentioned before, just to put them in the same, in the same direction, negative path length, degree centrality, page run centrality. You see here the right hippocampus it's clearly higher than, than many of the other kind of nodes in the brain. So, uh, and this is an important point. So the, the, these are differences, right? These are differences between vivid and dim. When we look at actually uh, at, the, and, at the individual and the, uh, separately at the vivid and the dim, the hippocampus is not important at all. And this is for me one another good reason why not doing resting state network, right? Because here, this, this fact, the fact that hippocampus is so critical for memory or so critical for network interaction comes only when you subtract dim versus dim. If you look at, at the, as I mentioned, this is number one. But number one, when you do the subtraction. When you don't do the subtraction, the hippocampus was 89 in page rank centrality, 86, about 90 nodes, right? 86 in, in degree centrality and 85 in, in negative path length. And in the BB, they still, I mean, was intermediate but it's still kind of a mediocre. You, basically, if you look at the network during rest, we'll never say the hippocampus is particularly important, right? I mean, it's a small region in, in the middle of the brain, what, I mean, you don't, right? But the moment that you do a memory task and you compare vivid versus dim, jumps as being the most important node in the whole brain, right? So, and, and then we looked at the, at the, not only that, but actually also, it changed massively the, the connections between Vivian and Divi. It's not only that it changed, become more integrated, but the regions maintain the same ranking in the terms. Actually, it reorganizes, right? So regions in which it was not connected to the hippocampus became connected. So this is actually how we calculated the, the FSR. And these are the regions that show the stronger reorganization. So some of the stronger reorganization in the hippocampus happened with the right inferior frontal gyros, with the left anterior cingulate, and some of regions that are part of the, of the retrieval network, like the supramarginal gyros, right? The part of the, is part of the, tempo, uh, the ventral parietal cortex on four, so. Yes? Oh, no, yeah, and definitely. In that sense, I think it's critical because, I mean, basically the resting state will give you like a kind of a baseline, right? Or kind of a, what is the baseline. But I mean, one thing you should also be a bit careful is that resting state is not, I mean, we can call it default, but I mean, the, the rest, rest is also one particular type of cognitive state, right? Some would say that actually is similar in a way a bit to, to memory retrieval, right? You are daydreaming, you are doing a particular thing. So, so it's, it's difficult to say that it's really a baseline in a way that they necessarily will provide the, the, the minimum type of uh, connection. But it will, I mean, in great part, the, the, the resting data networks reflect why matter connectivity, which in a way, I mean, are a general constraint for, for all cognitive tasks. I mean, the way I see it is, okay, the, the, if functional connectivity reflects why matter, it's kind of like the highways in a city, right? So you don't, I mean, the highways will tell you mostly where people go from one place to another. Big cities will be connected with highway, which reflects a lot of people moving among these cities, but doesn't really tell you, I mean, when people try to go to the supermarket, they may take a small street, right? So if your focus is to understand in shopping, right? I mean, local grocery shopping, right? If you're interested in grocery shopping, knowing where the highways are, not necessarily will tell you because people are just taking a local street that maybe is small, right? And not an important connectivity, right? So, so then, then they have to, in terms of the understanding general, okay, these regions are generally connected, it's important. To understanding like a specific task, like memory, this shows that it's not. Like the hippocampus, for example, will be like a major hub for memory. It's not a major hub in the default, so. Yeah. 
Okay, so um, we did another, second, another task using the same logic. So in a study 1B, but we instead, of, I mean, the reason why we got, I think, the right hippocampus is this was done for scenes. So it was really visual task. And so we basically did the same type of analysis with words, uh, and then we got the left hippocampus. So I will present this briefly because I actually kind of running out of time. But uh, it's a similar analysis. What we did here, uh, here we use a more standard, remember forgotten, so base hits and misses during retrieval. Uh, but again, we got kind of a, a reorganization of the left hippocampus. So what the, we did here that we didn't do in the other studies, also look at what we call the retrieval assembly. So it's a group of regions that are kind of more directly connected to the hippocampus, and we assume is, is kind of a cascading the process of the information from the hippocampus to the rest. So we identified 12 nodes that were associated with retrieval success and show with the stronger connections to the left hippocampus for remembered and forgotten. And these are, these are kind of, is the retrieval assembly here connected to the left hippocampus. And within the assembly, we, when we look at this assembly, we find that global efficiency within this network was greater for remembered and forgotten, even when you don't include the left hippocampus. So that shows that these regions tend to work together more during successful retrieval. So we form part of that group of kind of a regions that, that do an intermediate job between the hippocampus and the rest of the network. And looking at participation coefficient, is this measure is useful, is the difference between intramodule versus extra module. So uh, 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 that will be um, extra uh, minus intra will give you kind of the participation coefficient. So we also see that an increase for remembered and forgotten. So that means that not only they had highly integrated among themselves, but also had greater connections with the rest of the brain for, for the remembered and forgotten. Okay, so we have been talking about integration measures. Another really popular measure in graph theory is modularity, right? So remember when I showed you that, that, uh, that the depiction of the friends in Facebook from that guy that had this group of friends. So this is a very useful way of, of, of seeing how, uh, understanding the operation of the network. So um, here what we found is that when looking at modularity, we found that actually modularity was, gr it was great for forgotten than remembered. So suggesting that actually uh, having subgroups of regions working kind of more together actually is not good for retrieval. That retrieval require that high integration across the brain uh, rather than modularity. So there are other conditions, other tasks in which modularity may be efficient, right? But for this type of episodic retrieval in which you really need to kind of uh, uh, bring, pro I mean, our interpretations is that this is the integrations of memory traces distributed over the cortex. In addition, it's interacting with frontal control regions that are controlling the memory search and monitoring the retrieval output. So there's a is a really whole brain process, so actually then less modularity, is, and these results have been replicated by several labs. I mean, uh, uh, Mick Rack has found also that uh, less modularity was good for retrieval. Uh, also, uh, people in UCLA, um, Jesse Riesman also found, uh, we, had a, we had a meeting on the, in Budapest in the memory conference, and we had a, 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 a symposium on, on networks, and there were kind of three talks that found the same result. And then we actually, it's not only at the whole level of the whole kind of in general across the whole group, but when you look at individual differences, you see that the, the, the people with a greater D prime, so better, better memory, actually had less modularity. So they had more integrated brains. So, so that, that's, uh, I mean, this is important because we know that, for example, why matter deterioration in aging reduces communication, widespread communication. So the, the, these will make, tend to be, make the brains more modular in a way. So, so these are, okay, so actually turning to aging. So, um, so in this study on aging, we focus on item memory and, and source memory. I guess, I mean, as memory researchers, you know, kind of uh, item memory refers to what happens, source memory to refers to where, when, how it happens, so the context. Um, and uh, you probably also know that the uh, context memory is much more impaired in older adults than item memory. So sometimes older adults don't even show deficits in item memory. In simple, all new recognition tests, they are okay, but they want to remember specific details about the information they show deficits. So uh, the medial temporal lobe is critical for both item memory and source memory. So we know that damage to the medial temporal lobes, I mean, in amnesics, will impair both. 
but we know that frontal and parietal damage tends to impair more source memory than item memory, right? So, so actually, one of the main deficits, memory deficits in frontal damage is source memory deficits, right? So all the uh, frontal patients have difficulty remembering temporal order or, or other types of sources, and, and parietal damage uh, has been now a very popular topic of research. Ventral parietal also has been associated with deficits in, um, in source memory. Um, but these regions interact very closely with the medial temporal lows for source, for source memory than, than for item memory, right? So that has been shown in, in fMRI studies uh, with functional connectivity that there is also closer interaction between frontal parietal and MTL for source memory. So what they, we, we compare two groups of older adults, younger older adults in their 60s and older older adults in, the, in kind of uh, 70s and 80s. And before fMRI, they encoded words during a pleasantness or size judgment. During fMRI, they were tested in separate item memory, or so all new tests, or source memory, in which they had to decide which of the two tasks, pleasantness or size, they had performed. So this is a typical, so they not only to remember they have seen the word, they have to remember specifically which judgment they have done on the word, so separate blocks. And we investigated uh, three questions. First, we look at shared and distinct medial temporal lobe connectivity. For, for source and item, we look at the medial temporal lobe module. So the group of, of uh, uh, nodes within the medial temporal lobes that tend to go together and see whether they connect, they are also formed part in a module with other extra medial temporal regions. And then we, we look for um, MTL, in, MTL inside. We expected that MTL inside connections, so the connections within the, within the nodes in the medial temporal node module will be similar for item and source memory, whereas MTL outside connections, so uh, the between MTL and frontal and parietal will be greater for source than for item memory, based on the previous evidence, right? And so we will also look at the MTL connectivity with source memory performance uh, in terms of the proportion of outside versus inside connections. Um, we, we prepare them that uh, we use uh, the measure of participation coefficient which, as I mentioned before, is the difference between outside versus inside or extra module versus intramodular connection. And we expect that it will be correlated with source memory efficient, right? So, so again, this is also similar to the idea I was telling before in terms of the hippocampus being interconnected to the brain. But this is, is still more for, for source memory, which requires memory for specific visual details or temporal details or so forth than for item memory, which can be more based on familiarity, it's just an all new decision. And finally, we look at the effects of aging and we investigated this idea of compensatory recruitment. Many other studies in functional neuroimaging of aging have shown that older adults show more widespread activation patterns. I mean, something that um, we found many years ago was these more bilateral activation patterns in older adults, and many other studies have found the same. So one possibility is that actually older adults compensate for more local deficits by relying more in, in outside connections. I mean, basically more, more extra modular or integrated processes as well. So we found that these are, these are the nodes for, that we found in both the IEM and, and source mem. Uh, source uh, IEM network and uh, SM networks. And uh, when, we, I mean, it's difficult to see it here. So here you're only seeing the, the MTL module. So, I mean, the, the, the way that a module is defined is using, for example, a, a measure is called Q. It's not that we say, okay, well, these regions are just look to be more similar. There's a, there's a, there is a measure that actually separates really all these modules, breaks them in a data-driven format, right? No, no, it's not, we are not deciding. Basically, when we look at that, there was one group of nodes that contain all the MTL regions that were operating as a module, like those friends, right, from high school, right, that tends to go together, right? So uh, we call it MTL plus because in addition to the MTL included other regions, right? So, and we have the MTL plus module for the item memory network contains six all six MTN nodes, I you think you can see it here, one, two, three, one, two, three, on both sides. These are bigger, make them bigger just so you can see them, right? And for the source memory, we found that only two of those it were part of the, of the module, and the anterior tempora were not, which is very interesting because anterior temporal regions which includes the anterior parhippocampal gyrus, like perirhinal anterior uh, regions that uh, sometimes are actually associated with familiarity and not necessarily with, with recollection. So, but in contrast, we saw that the, the MTL module included many other frontal and parietal regions. So basically, 
during source memory, the MTL operates in direct interaction with frontal and parietal regions, whereas in the item memory, it's much more local to the, to the medial temporal lobes. So it's, wow. I, I, wonder, I guess I will skip the last study, so don't worry. So, um, well, basically we found that the, uh, the, um, for inside versus outside connections, the, the, the inside connections were similar for item memory and source memory, but the outside connections were greater for source than for item memory. And then when we look at the participation coefficient, which is this, this the relative difference of outside versus inside, here you can see clearly that was greater for source versus item memory. When we look more specifically about the connections, you see can hear that the hippocampus with the lateral prefrontal cortex was uh, stronger for source memory, but also the connections between frontal parietal regions were greater for source memory, so greater interaction. So now turning to, age, to performance and aging, we look at the correlation between kind of the efficiency. Uh, we use an efficiency score, which is the RTs divided by accuracy. So actually less is better, right? Because still these are kind of like reaction times. So, and, and we found that in the, for the SEM network here in blue, the individuals with higher MTL participation coefficient, that is more outside than inside, had greater efficiency. So again, more integration across the brain was actually associated with better performance, where for the IEM network was not significant. So it was not critical really for IEM that you have a very integrated network than as is for, for source memory. And we found similar results with when you just focus on the hippocampus, right? So only on the hippocampus. And, and finally, in terms of aging, we found that older adults actually showed uh, an increase actually in the participation coefficient for the source memory, which we interpret as compensatory. So perhaps compensating for the local deficit in the hippocampus, the older adults are recruiting more this, this connectivity with, with other frontal regions, which is consistent with other evidence. Okay, so I think I won't, uh, I won't present the last study, which is a TMS study, unless many of you are interested. I raise your hands, many of you are interested in TMS? Raise your hands. Okay, half of the room. You want to see it or? or? Okay, I just, I just show you the, well, I mean, why, I, or we can make, I mean, I could take time from the second part if you want. I can do 10 minutes and then do the second shorter. It takes five minutes, it's okay. Okay. So I'm sorry, I, actually I thought yesterday <laughs> when Christian was going over time, I said, tomorrow I will go, <laughs> I will not do that. <laughs> and I just say, I'm doing the same thing, I'm sorry. So, uh, but I guess uh, it ends up being uh, always uh, longer than I expect. I have a rule of thumb, which is one slide per minute, <laughs> but then uh, sometimes it doesn't work. <laughs> but, uh, so, so then, so I was talking about the compensation idea. So the compensation actually has been, has been shown in if, uh, after a stroke, right? So you, you have, so that the recovery from a, a language functions and motor functions after a stroke has been associated with the recruitment of other regions in the brain that are compensating. So TMS is ideal to study this type of phenomenon because you can produce a transient deficit and then see how other regions compensate. So that requires measure combining TMS with fMRI, so to see, to see the changes of that. So this is what we did. So we disrupted left prefrontal cortex activity during encoding using TMS, and then, uh, well, we disrupted, the actually reduced, impaired, or enhanced uh, left PLC activity during encoding, then look at the effects on, on left prefrontal activity and functional connectivity to the rest of the brain, and then look at the connection with Y matter, how the Y matter modulates that, those drugs, right? So is that clear, the idea? So TMS, fMRI activity, fMRI connectivity, and then the relation between fMRI connectivity and Y matter, yes? Do you remember which, which of the local areas was the PFC that used to? Yeah, so actually was, was the, the middle frontal gyros, probably area 946, yeah. So, so then we actually use this, uh, we were looking at the, whether the effects will be more local or global. So we use these measures of uh, within module degree and between module degree. So basically once you have the modules, right, you can, you can see the, the, the connectivity within the module or across the modules. So this is similar to the inside, outside, but this is another kind of another way of doing that. So, and, and then we made two predictions. First, we expected that one hertz TMS which is known to be inhibitory, will reduce local activity, right? 
uh, but it will enhance global connectivity to, in a compensatory function, right? And, and then, uh, whereas the 5 hertz, which is excitatory, will increase the, the left PLC activity, but uh, will only increase kind of the local uh, connectivity and local activity, wouldn't produce the, the other effects. So the idea is that if you disrupt the local region, you will see a compensatory effect. And this, there is some evidence for that uh, from TMS too. So, and, and then we link the uh, RTMS effects to Y matter, and then our prediction is that these global connectivity effects will correlate with Y matter quality, indicating that Y matter constrains the effects of TMS across the brain, right? Because if you impair the fibers, then it will tend to impair the results. So we use a task with people study word pairs, like the boy is riding a horse with the help of a sentence, and then they, uh, that test they pre presented the pairs that were identical or recombined, and they decided to say whether they were identical or recombined, so an associated recognition test. So we had a first session in which there was an fMRI localizer, in which they did the task and wanted to show what brain regions were involved. In particular, you find the, the particular left prefrontal region that will be associated with better memory later. I mean, most of you know with the subsequent memory effects is greater activity for subsequently remembered than forgotten trials. So we wanted to localize the left prefrontal region showing subsequent memory effects. Then they came for another day, and this is the kind of the regions where we most subjects ended being actually, uh, I mean, there were some also activity more in the ventral, but we didn't want to TMS the ventral so much because there are muscles there, right, that kind of, uh, they are sometimes uncomfortable. So uh, still the activity is spread into the dorsolateral, so we TMS more the dorsolateral. So, um, so then the session two, they came, they had a T1 to localize, to place them in the scan. Then, then we did a concurrent TMS fMRI. So while running the scanner, we did pulses of TMS just to, just to confirm kind of the, the effects of uh, that the TMS was working in terms of being the uh, exciting kind of uh, the regions. And we found that this is the, an 80% motor threshold 105 motor threshold, 120 motor threshold, and, and you see here in the, stimula in the stimulated side, actually activity increase with TMS, right? And these are other regions that were affected too. So, so it's not only local, it kind of produces a, a brain effect. And then we, we pull, the, the, uh, pull the person out of the scanner and then do 10 minutes of uh, TMS back in the scanner. So my Simon called this a torpedo method, right? Because you kind of go back and forth, take out TMS, another inside, or it's more like a cooking in an oven, right? So <laughs> you, you add some of the, <laughs> something to the cake and back to the oven, right? So 10 minutes of, and then uh, 10 minutes of TMS, another encoding retrieval trial, and then another uh, TM, DTI, I mean, and then another five. So the one hertz and the 10 hertz were counterbalanced in time, right? So. Anyway, so we found that TMS reduced the subsequent memory effect for one hertz, but increased it for five hertz, consistent that actually improved the memory, the, the, the role of the regions in memory. But in terms of the network, we, let me show you the bottom line. So we did this, this modularity analysis, and then we look at within module degree, and between module degree, let me just show the bottom line here. So we found that the, for the one hertz increased memory related between module degree, so when we TMS the, the left frontal, it increased connectivity across modules, and particularly with the right frontal cortex, which was driving primarily the effect. And you see that actually there was a correlation between the amount of univariate activity in the left prefrontal and the, 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 and the BMD, so the between module degrees. So the less the activity caused by a TMS in that region, the more the connectivity increase across the brain. And so this, this fits with the idea that of a compensation, right? So, and then finally with the role of Y matter, so we, we did the, the functional connectivity so the, and, and the structural connectivity and focus on the correlation between the functional and the structural. And we found that it, was, it was, didn't change uh, in one, five, one hertz and five hertz for the within module, but it was greater for the one hertz for the between module. So basically, as the, as the path gets longer, kind of uh, connectivity gets more dependent on Y matter. So that increases the correlation, right? So it's the, for longer connectivity, Y matter plays a, plays a greater role and these effects of the, of the one hertz. So, okay, so sorry, I went over time. So, if you have any questions. Yes. 
So I work on functional connectivity. Uh -huh. But reviewers sometimes ask me, what does functional connectivity mean? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, this is, uh, as you know, I mean, it's very, the, we, with hemodynamic uh, activity, we don't can no, know specific about the, the, the underlying mechanisms, right? So sometimes you know necessarily regions that, let's say, are, are inhib inhibiting each other, you expect to see a right, could be an increase in connectivity. So we, we, don't, we don't know necessarily from functional connectivity with effects are excitatory or inhibitory. We can only say that these two regions are, I mean, the way we do it are, co-activated over time, so this tends to be possibly communicating with each other, but that's of course is a big assumption. I mean, you have a good point. So, so still, I mean, many of the, I, I, I believe that the, the method is sound because most of the findings are consistent with what we know, for example, from why matter and well-established tracks, right? So the regions that tend to show stronger connectivity I also show kind of a stronger, y, I mean, bigger white matter tracks, and also are regions that collaborate, that we assume to collaborate during the task, right? So, so that uh, in terms of the, this PSA's analysis, for example, which are easier to, to study than the whole brain network, right? I mean, this particularly in case of memory, this connection, let's say, between the, the angular gyros and the hippocampus, right? The angular gyros and the hippocampus, they tend to show very similar recollection-related activity, and they show a strong, connectivity and the, and the hippocampus with the cortex, which I will talk later in the second hour, that are assumed to be interacting during the recovery of memory traces, are also showing connectivity as a function of, of memory recovery. So there is, there is, there is I think, uh, many findings that support the idea that the connectivity is a, is a sound method, right? Yes? Um, I have a follow-up question in that regard. So you, in the beginning, you had this table comparing mm -hmm. the resting state networks and the PSAs, mm -hmm. and you said the advantage of the PSAs is that it should be a uh, um, hypothesis driven rather than data. But all the, all the network type analyses that you showed here, uh, they are essentially, from what I understand, or how I understand them, completely data driven. Um, so my question is kind of would there be a way to, um, to use these kind of uh, network analyses um, or restrict them in some way that would be hypothesis driven? Well, I mean, there, there are, I would say that even though they are data driven in terms of uh, how you, you obtain the findings, the, the interpretation or the focus on the analysis is hypothesis driven, right? Let's like say, for example, uh, the, the, the fact that we are comparing source memory and item memory that are assumed to have different types of connectivity between medial temporal and frontoparietal is hypothesis driven based on previous univariate research, right? So you can start with previous research and generate a, a hypothesis about how regions should be connected and then use the, the findings, data-driven findings to confirm that, that these are regions are operating that way. So in that sense, it's different than, than the coming up and saying, okay, well, these, the, these are regions that tend to go together, right? And we don't know what they're doing or why they're going together, right? Which is kind of the, the purely data-driven. It's just, we know that they're going together here. We have a hypothesis that they are they are going together, for example, more during source memory than item memory, right? Or that the hippocampus uh, should be more connected to the rest of the brain during source, source successful. I mean, the fact that you are adding cognitive, I mean, cognitive performance that allows you to be more specific in terms of what you expect, and in a way limits the interpretation. So, but I mean, there are there are ways of uh, doing a. Uh, network analysis that actually start with a hypothesis and you're already biased. So there is a, a version of ICA that I think is called in HiBica, hypothesis driven ICA. So there are ways of, uh, there are methods that you could actually build the hypothesis directly in the analysis, right? That basically will already in a way have, or, or some of the Bayesian kind of methods in which you kind of uh, start with more kind of, uh, they are, uh, that's the goal, right? Okay, sorry. <laughs>